Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Junior Dome's A Spark. I'm Junior Dome, and thank you for joining us today. With me is Thomas Skinner, Senior Executive Producer at Free to Choose Network. Welcome, Thomas. Uh, Tom, tell us about the Free to Choose Network. Free to Choose, of course, was the title of Milton Friedman's book and the uh, television series that created the book uh, that Bob Chittister uh, brought to public television in 1980. Uh, and so the Free to Choose Network continues really the work of, of Bob and Milton. Uh, the goal is to use popular media to, um, uh, to uh, enhance personal, uh, economic, and uh, political freedom. Uh, and to do that, that underscore, do that through popular media. Uh, my role in that is to assure that our programs are of the highest quality and that, um, uh, and that they are in tune with, uh, with our mission. Uh, and we've been pretty successful that way. Uh, my involvement, as you ask, I mean, my relationship with Bob Chinister goes back 60 60 years. Uh, I, I uh, cast Bob Chittister in a, in a, uh, a role as the uh, uh, young, a young singer in my master's thesis at the University of Michigan. Uh, it was called The Flying Beret, and Bob played a young man called Jean-Pierre. Bob was in the glee club at Michigan, had a fine voice. He still has a fine voice. As a matter of fact, he sang to us during his... Uh, the ceremony when he received his doctorate at Northwood. Um, and so uh, then we went our separate ways. Uh, and Bob ended up as the manager of the public television station in Erie. Uh, and I ended up after an academic career uh, at Michigan and San Diego. Uh, I ended up at the public television station Hershey. And there were state meetings and, and uh, various things there that, um, that brought our, us back together again socially. Uh, and then when the public television, uh, Pennsylvania Public Television Network was created, um, we saw each other quite a bit. And we were there with the governor at the signing of it together and so on. And then once again, our, our paths separated. I went off to Pittsburgh and... Um, uh, headed up the uh, production area of the public television station there. We, we were one of the major producers uh, for PBS for years. The top 10 programs were all programs that we produced. Uh, and Bob went then uh, on and stayed with Erie until he then brought Milton Friedman into the picture. And Bob, being an entrepreneur, then split off from Erie and created, um, well, first of all, I think it was called Chittister Creative Associates. And then it was called um, the Robert R, the, the, uh, a fund named after his father. Uh, and, and Bob got a very lucrative contract with John Malone in Denver to do, I think, three television series. And he called me and asked me if he, I'd come and advise him and consult with him on production. Uh, and I did with a couple of other colleagues from uh, Pittsburgh that we had mutual relationships with. And so Bob and I then came back together for that. Uh, and it wasn't until, I guess, oh, 2000, 1999, something like that, that Bob called and asked me if I would executive produce uh, and write the uh, biography, television biography of Milton Friedman, which he had just uh, got. Milton to agree to do. And uh, I said yes, and that went swimmingly. And after that, Bob asked me to join 
uh, Free to Choose Network as the full-time uh, executive, senior executive producer uh, in charge of all of their productions, uh, both for the public television and for the for schools. Um, and I did, and we've been doing that year after year from then until now. I guess that's a brief summary. Does that does that answer your questions? <laughs> it entices me. So one of the things that crosses my mind is uh, just uh, who is the audience for free to choose? I don't mean uh, intellectual or things like that. I mean age. At this point in time, do you do things for tots, for primary school, for high school, for college? What what is the scope? Because I think it's grown quite a bit since its early days. Well, well, it has. Uh, there are uh, uh, there, there there are lots of audiences. First, first of all, uh, well, let's take a particular take a, a program as an example. Uh, we did two hours uh, on the real um, um, Adam Smith, uh, and and uh, that was for public television stations nationwide. We had a large audience. Uh, people on the left, people on the right, people in the middle, people who never heard of Adam Smith, other people who did but didn't uh, f didn't really focus in on on uh, him as uh, as we thought they might, um, and and so that program r reached uh, oh I guess a million and a half, two million people, something like that, and then from that program. Uh, we edited a smaller, smaller pieces about Adam Smith, and they were for the uh, organization called isit.org, which is the educational division, uh, the school division of Free to Choose Network. And, uh, and, and, and we, we, um, we make these programs available. They're for middle school students, usually high school and middle school students, although we have done some very much things for much younger students. We did a three three part series called Pups for Liberty, which was about the uh, about the American Revolution. Uh, but it was told in a in a uh, Disney animated uh, way uh, with with professionals who did work for Disney and uh, and came on to do this project for us. And um, and in it, uh, the British were the uh, were the cats, and the uh, colonists were the dogs. And so the show was all the, th the the three pieces were all told that way. And that was that was the only thing really we've done for primary students. Everything else we've done are for middle school students. And uh, we have in the neighborhood of of three hundred thousand uh, students watching uh, one or more of those programs every year. They're distributed free uh, by uh, uh, streaming and on um, as CDs. You know, I, I want to encourage you to consider this younger group of primary students, like the idea of cartoons and other ways of doing it. Um, so maybe you'll think about doing that. But in your own right, you've done so many things that I found interesting planet earth but this journey into self i watched part of that and uh did how did that come about like watching an old italian movie it's in black and white it was recorded on viticon cameras um i was a professor at san diego state uh college at that point teaching television production and i developed a relationship with the western behavioral sciences institute in la jolla uh, and the, uh, the lead psychologist there, and I had an interest in psychology, uh, was Carl Rogers, the famous uh, uh, man from Wisconsin who developed the, uh, the encounter group. And in those conversations, I had a social meeting I, I, I had with uh, Carl, and uh, he suggested that it might be an interesting idea to put an, an encounter group on television. And that he would organize it and so on. And would I uh, come on and do the uh, the television part of it? And I, I worked with a fellow named Bill McGaw, who was in charge of promotion and, uh, and development at the uh, Western Behavioral Sciences Institute. And uh, I uh, 
we had a television studio at San Diego State. Uh, we had uh, uh, advanced students who knew how to run cameras and do that sort of thing. And, uh, and we had professionals hovering over them in the technical area so that everything you know, looked good. Uh, and I devised the set and the idea and I directed it. Uh, and directing it, it, it meant at that point, you know, cutting from one camera to another electronically, um, w which we did. Um, the program attracted the, the, it was on television, uh, I think in three parts or four, I've forgotten, uh, on, a, on commercial television, uh, which was syndicated by the college at the time with, through a series called San Diego State Profile. And it was seen by Jennifer Jones and her husband, Stanley Kramer, who's a producer, you know, Jennifer Jones, of course. And uh, they thought that it should be uh, converted to film, uh, which had to be done in those days and, uh, and uh, submitted for an Academy Award. And uh, the, um, uh, they did convert it to film. They showed it. I think it had to be shown for a week in a theater. Uh, and they essentially kept everything that I had done with it, except they cut uh, the middle out of the, the, the piece so that it fit the time frame that they were looking at. Uh, and uh, they then um, uh, submitted it to the uh, Academy and, uh, and it won the Academy Award uh, for a uh, feature documentary. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that that night of the Emmys, it did not win. Uh, a film called uh, The Young Americans won. Uh, and the next morning, I got a call telling me that the uh, Young Americans had been disqualified because it was not produced in the right year. And the, uh, the Academy Award was, uh, was uh, Oscar was presented to us. And it sits today at the Western Behavioral Sciences Institute uh, in La Jolla. What are some of the satisfactions you get from doing these projects? They're so different. I, I think it all comes in general about making people, give, giving, giving people information that makes them uh, live a better life, make the world a better place. Uh, uh, it's, all about, it's all about education. In television, it happens through storytelling. But it's, it, um, uh, I, I think it's generally, you know, why have I spent, you know, 60 years of my life doing it? Um, because it's very, it's, it is satisfying to me. It's also satisfying to, to know that in some small way, we've increased the, uh, you know, the scope of, uh, of a number of people significantly. You know, so much of our people I read now are depressed because they're sort of locked up in their homes because of the virus. If yeah. you were, what would attract you about making another film or another TV program? What, what, focus would you choose or would you jump away from it? Well, I mean, I can give you an example. We, we, we've just received uh, funding and are proceeding to, uh, to launch a project in, in December uh, with, um, with PJ O'Rourke, the author as a host. Oh, yeah. Uh, the program is, is, is about free speech. Uh, and it's been something that we on the staff have talked about, Bob, Bob Chittister and I have talked about it, you know, for a number of years. And Bob came up with a wonderful concept uh, and then threw it to me to say, now make, make some television out of that. And the concept basically is that, is that free speech is the kind of the basis of all civilization. Uh, and that we cannot have a, 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 a social uh, successful society if, if it weren't for free speech and exp expression. P.J. O'Rourke says uh, free speech is kind of like our opposing thumb. Uh, it allows us to do all manner of things. So we're going to explore uh, six types of speech through stories that will occur all over the world with P.J. as host. He'll be on location in, in some instances. Um, and um, 
will explore commercial speech, religious speech, uh, uh, entertaining speech. Um, I've forgotten the whole list uh, here, but uh, there, there are six. And um, that's going to be a very interesting, fresh look at things. We're not just interested in, you know, uh, conflicts on the college campus and that sort of thing. We're trying to get at a really broader uh, uh, concept of free speech. And we think with PJ and all and shooting all over the world and stories that will be national and international, um, that we'll really have a first class series. We're going to, we're going to spend three years to do it. Uh, and, uh, we'll start in December. So it's, it's that, and, and it just didn't happen. I mean, it's, it's, uh, evolved over a period of a, of a year or so that, that, that we, that we would do this. Uh, in a similar way, our, our series that, that just ran all over the United States uh, and very successfully, uh, a more or less perfect union, uh, is now being used by public television stations because of the, the epidemic uh, for in-school, in-house learning uh, during, during this time. And they're broadcasting these shows, these three hours with Doug Ginsburg uh, uh, during the day. So they're, they're accessible to students and families, you know, during the day after a run in which about 95%, I think it was of the public television stations broadcast this program, many of them in prime time. Uh, and, but I, I remember, I mean, how things get started. Uh, we were with Doug Ginsburg and Walter Williams, uh, doing a piece, uh, for a show, which is a biography of Walter Williams. And we, uh, at the end of it, I remember Bob Chinister saying to Doug, you know, you know, we really think so much like we should do something together. How about a series on the constitution? Doug said, well, I'd like to do that. Bob said, well, it's going to cost a lot of money if we do it right. Let's, let's figure out how we can do that. And the way we went and it took, I guess about a year and we raised a little over what, it was three and a half million or something like that. And this is really a stunning series, this three hours, called A More or Less Perfect Union. It's a very contemporary, fresh look at the, the Constitution. I mean, we start with what the Constitution is. We go on to what it isn't. We deal with the amendments. And in the end, uh, the last, last of the three shows is called The Constitution at Risk. It couldn't be a more timely uh, series that we've done. Boy, it's impressive that you take this on. Not that you you would take it on, but the commitment and the extent of it is really admirable. Do you have more than one project going at a time because these take so many years to bring into reality? Usually two or three. We're, we're doing a follow-up with Doug uh, Ginsburg on the uh, Declaration of Independence and how the words from the Declaration uh, ring throughout the world today, not always with the same kind of success that we've had. I mean, take Hong Kong, for example, uh, or Belarus. But it, this will be an international show with Doug all over the world, uh, uh, analyzing how those ideas, which then became the kind of con conscience of the Constitution, uh, have, have resonated throughout the world. Uh, we're doing a couple little projects for, for is it in which, uh, you know, you mentioned getting to younger kids. We're going to do something with younger kids on, uh, uh, Ben Franklin's, um, uh, books that he did every year, uh, yeah. on the, um, uh, kind of poor, poor Richard's almanac. And we're going to yes. do those probably in some cartoon fashion for very younger people. We're also doing a show on, on diplomacy, the importance of diplomacy and statesmanship in the world. And that's springing out of a number of years ago, we did a biography of uh, George Schultz, beautiful oh. show called Turmoil and Triumph. And um, uh, George, who uh, just turned 100, uh, is uh, we're going to use pieces out of that show, plus other uh, diplomats and uh, new interviews and so on, to do probably a 15-minute piece uh, for uh, for schools. 
on the importance of diplomacy, the importance of statesmanship, and how how it has accomplished various things. Um, you have to go back, I guess, all the way to Benjamin Franklin and to Jefferson, uh, where American state, statesmanship began. Uh, so if it weren't for if it weren't for Franklin and Jefferson's statesmanship in Paris, uh, we probably wouldn't be a nation today because we wouldn't have Correct. won the war. <laughs> I'm glad you're taking those on, and I'm really quite interested. They have, in, at least in one case, worldwide appeal, and uh, you will really do a good job. Does your wife have a role in in your professional side? Well, not really. My first wife, Beth, was a was a preschool teacher. Uh, and uh, my uh, she died in 06, and I'm married to Marley's man, who was a friend who, whose husband died uh, in 04. Uh, and Marley's has a great interest. Marley's actually has a greater interest. She's German-born. She and I wrote a book together on, uh, on her life uh, after the war. She was a, a stewardess for Lufthansa after surviving the war with her parents, uh, a little town in, in northern Germany. Uh, and um, I've, I've engaged her in uh, you know, various things. When we did the, uh, the show about Adam Smith, Marley uh, accompanied me to Scotland where we uh, worked with the crew. We actually did a little cameo in the piece because they needed a couple of, of stand-in actors. Uh, but she's got no particular role, you know, except to be very patient with the fact that, that uh, my work you know, comes and goes and comes and goes. I have three different, uh, three different conference calls, Zoom calls today. I'm also on the board of the Traverse City Orchestra, so that takes a little bit of, little bit of time. I'm interested uh, just separately in a sense of time. I think we Americans, as we mentioned before we started the, uh, the program, have a sense of impatience. Look, research, decide, put into reality. Well, other cultures it could be 100 years, 150 years, 10 years, and uh, it therefore influences your sense of self, sense of uh, success, sense of optimism, uh, sense of almost um, anything and everything. And I, I, I know myself, I try to I try to, which is really impossible to do, I try to put myself into the culture of the place I'm visiting, mm -hmm. not with my American values and tempo, but try through reading and talking and so forth to, to understand theirs. And I, I kind of feel we should do that a little bit here right now, but I'm thrilled you are, you are taking on some of these other uh, kinds of issues uh, for us. Um, because storytelling and visual storytelling is the way we learn these days, and it will be more so um, going forward. So she's from another country. What did she teach you that changed, or did she, that changed you as an American or as a, an adult, if I may ask? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I think... Um, um... Patience, I suppose, you know, in terms of understanding that uh, from a different culture, you think a little differently, uh, you have a little different sense of priorities. And of course, the, the, uh, <laughs> the important thing, you know, is that she survived the war and she survived the period after the war, which was, as Marley says, almost worse than the war because they had nothing to eat. Uh, I'm the cook in this house and... Um, uh, you don't waste anything. Uh, so he taught me that, uh, you know, and as I say, patience along the way. But uh, she, she has a, is an extraordinary uh, woman with a very interesting background. Um, and uh, when I was at Northwood, uh, Tim Nash told me that he had uh, found her book and he was looking for this coming oh. in the mail, forward to reading it. Uh, it's called Becoming Marley's Man. Uh, and it's a memoir uh, about Marlies's life, and uh, it's a uh, we're we're a good pair. Uh, you know, we we've learned to live together. We've been married for ten years now. 
uh, but we always add our first marriage too. You know, when you have a good marriage, you, you don't throw that off. So when people ask how long you've been married, the answer is 105 years. Oh, <laughs> for both sides. <laughs> for oh, both sides. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, uh, would you say you're an introvert? Do you read uh, a lot? Uh, I read a lot. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. I read about, you know, two or three books at the same time, back and forth. I'm reading Jim Baker's biography uh, now, along with a couple of espionage books. So it's a, yeah, I, I move back. And then, then of course, work requires, you know, once we say we're gonna do a show or a series, a show on the Declaration of Independence, well, you better read and find out as much as you can because you need to discover where the stories are. Uh, and, and, and that's what, that's really, you know, if, if I have a, a something to contribute in this business, it's, it's not only finding the stories, but figuring out how to put them on the screen. What are unusual ways that you kind of, because if you don't, if you, if you don't keep the audience with you every minute, it's very easy for them to turn things off. This, these days, it's easier than ever. Um, but, um, but as I say, I've been doing that a long time. I mean, even with the with the geographic series, uh, you know, with Planet Earth, with all those those programs, with the National Academy of Science, it was always a matter of finding, you know, what is the story, how to tell it, how to tell it in an unexpected, interesting way. When we went to Pittsburgh, uh, my colleague Lloyd Kaiser and I went to Pittsburgh, and the goal Tom, was to. I'm so embarrassed, but I'm going to have to stop because we're almost out of time. I want to hear the story, but <laughs> off camera. Uh -huh. So what we've learned from Tom is he's basically a do-gooder, a helper, someone who wants to make the world better, which of course is something we should try, especially being Americans, and that he does it through storytelling, as I mentioned. On, on the arts that are available today. And to his credit, he is now working on other projects of major interest, so follow him. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next week. Be kind, be kind to someone you know and someone you don't know. Thank you, and thank you, Tom. Thank you. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.